Welcome, everyone, to uh, this historical materialism broadcast uh, about the new, relatively new book, Karel Kosik and the Dialectics of the Concrete, which um, has been edited by uh, myself, Joe Grim Feinberg, as well as my two colleagues, Jan Mervart and Ivan Landa, who are both here with us today. And uh, Ivan will be speaking for the three of us and for the authors of this edited volume. Um, and we also have uh, two guests, Monika Wozniak and Georgi Medarov, who will be commenting on the book. Um, the book uh, was published at the end of last year by Brill in the Historical Materialism series and will be out in December uh, with Haymarket Books. So uh, we'll look forward to, to this uh, new paperback version. And um, I'm looking forward to hearing uh, the discussion of the book today with our, with our guests. Uh, but first, uh, a few words about who Karel Kosik was and, uh, and how the book came about. Um, Karel Kosik, born in 1926, is best known for his 1963 work, The Dialectics of the Concrete, which uh, was widely read at the time. Was, uh, it made him the most prominent Marxist philosopher to come out of Czechoslovakia. He is also known as a creative interpreter of humanism and phenomenology in relation to Marxism. Also a leading voice in the for democratization during the Prague Spring around 1968. Uh, later was close to many of the dissidents and oppositional figures in Czechoslovakia. Uh, and then after 1989, and the end of Communist Party rule was one was a rare voice on the left in that period um, and continued to speak out publicly and write essays uh, uh, as uh, from the perspective of a left of left philosophy, still uh, combining his interpretation of uh, Heideggerian phenomenology with uh, with a certain interpretation of Marxism, though his views changed over time, which we'll discuss today. Uh, and he passed away in 2003. And this, uh, this edited volume is the first, first proper edited volume that's really discussed his work from a wide range of perspectives. Uh, the main motivation behind the, the book was both to put Karokosik in his historical context, which is not well enough known uh, among his international readers who are not necessarily familiar with the, the context of Czechoslovakia in the 1960s as well as the 50s and through the through the 90s and early 2000s when Kosik was still working. But but a, a second motivation was also to to make the case that Kosik's work is something worth uh, considering as an original contribution to critical philosophy today that transcends its historical moment. Um, he is a philosopher of labor and praxis, of cognition and economic structure, and of the multiple crises faced by uh, modern humanity uh, in relation to the possibility of revolution. So we brought together for this book uh, a number of scholars um, from multiple generations and fields and countries to look at Kosik's work and um, tracing the reception of his work in when it was very widely discussed at certain historical moment and then much less discussed later. And, um, and we're hoping to try to bring Kosik's work back into uh, international discussions of philosophy and Marxism. So, uh, so today uh, I wanted, uh, I organized this and uh, I should say, I'm very sorry that if you were hoping to have uh, Isabel Jacobs uh, chair the debate, which I was also hoping to have, she unfortunately fell ill just earlier this week and was unable to, to chair it. 
and so I'm stepping in for her. She wrote a very, I think, insightful review of the book that uh, you can search for online. It's Isabel Jacobs, uh, Karo Kosik and the Dialectics of the Concrete. Um, so thanks to her for that and for her willingness to be involved in this discussion, although she couldn't make it in the end. So, so I'm stepping in, and then I, I, as I said earlier, I invited Ivan Landa to to give the perspective of an author and and a specialist on Kostik and his work. Um, and then I also wanted to invite specialists on Marxism in Eastern Europe who who have other areas of expertise. And for for that reason. Uh, we will also turn to Monica and Georgi. So uh, just briefly, so you know who the people discussing are. Ivan Landa is a researcher at the Institute of Philosophy, the Czech Academy of Sciences, um, where he, as well as Jan Mervat and I also all work together and were, uh, and co-edited this volume. And, um, Ivan is also a specialist in Czech philosophy, has written numerous articles um, on Czech Marxism as well as phenomenology and Hegelianism. Uh, Monika Wozniak is uh, an assistant professor at the University of Wrocław in Poland uh, and also has recently joined the Institute of Philosophy of the Czech Academy of Sciences and is a specialist in Polish and Marxist philosophy um, and uh, and a co-editor of uh, a special issue of the journal Contradictions um, that will be coming soon, the special issue on eco-socialism. And finally, Georgi Medarov is an assistant professor at the Institute for Philosophy and Sociology of the Bulgarian Academy of Sciences and specializes, among other things, in Bulgarian social theory. So I hope that we can have uh, a good discussion debate about um, the various aspects and and contributions as well as perhaps limitations of Karo Kosik's work in comparison to developments in other parts of Europe and the world. Now, um, after that brief introduction, I'd like to quickly turn things over to the other uh, speakers. So um, I'll start with a question for Ivan. Um, before we get later into the, the question of how Kosik maybe transcended his uh, historical and geographical context, as, as we as editors have tried to argue, I wanted to ask you, Ivan, uh, if you could say more about that context itself, uh, especially for people unfamiliar with Karo Kosik. I think we'll have a mixed audience of experts and non-experts. Um, could you say a bit more about how his uh, how his writing struck such a chord with uh, the public in the nineteen nineteen sixties Czechoslovakia? Um, in what sense was he a product of this moment? What sense did he maybe formulate mm -hmm. problems of this moment in, in new and innovative ways that made that made him uh, stand out there? Okay, so hello everybody, good evening. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, express my thanks to Joe and Paul for uh, organizing this uh, this event. And uh, not only for my part, but on, on behalf of uh, all contributors. And uh, as uh, to your question, as I'm not a historian, I won't go into, into like uh, political and uh, economic situation uh, the 50s and 60s. But I should rather focus on, uh, on sketching briefly uh, the philosophical landscape yeah, in the 1950s, which were, um, as I uh, assume, very important for, for uh, Kosik as he uh, actually worked on, on his dialectics uh, uh, of the concrete during the late 50s. He finished the book uh, in 1961. Uh, although it was uh, published for the first time in 19, uh, 1963. And uh, I think like much important uh, or many important things uh, happened uh, during the 1950s. 
And if I could bring it under one umbrella, uh, I would say that at that time, what happened was a methodological turn yeah, in, uh, in Eastern Marxism, also in the Soviet Marxism. And uh, this method methodological turn uh, came out from, uh, from the critical assessment of, uh, of Stalinist uh, orthodoxy or uh, intellectual Stalinism, I would, I would call it as such. And uh, it's interesting that at that time, like two layers uh, somehow intervene, uh, two layers of uh, the Stalinist uh, influence. Yeah. And uh, one of them was uh, this early, uh, maybe I should uh, say that uh, at the beginning that uh, intellectual Stalinism uh, involves many different conceptual elements. And I will focus only one on one element, which is the conception of, uh, of dialectics. Yeah. And uh, here we have like two uh, important uh, elements or layers. One of them is this early Stalinist conception of dialectics, where uh, he is uh, uh, he models dialectics on the on the idea or uh, metaphor of uh, of organism. Yeah, so he thinks that uh, reality, uh, society, etc., uh, can be viewed as a sort of you know a functional system where every part plays certain function within this system it can be replaced with uh, other part uh, playing the same function etc and uh, this uh, system like any organism just evolves in time uh, some you know contradictions arise there uh, we have like uh, elements of uh, old society and the new society, which makes this contradiction, internal contradiction. And this contradiction has to be somehow resolved. And this uh, occurs in revolutions, which uh, are portrayed by Stalin as, uh, as an explosion, as a zrif, uh, as a, something that happens suddenly and like explosion uh, destroys the old world and uh, brings about the new world. So uh, this dynam dynamism, is very specific for for early Stalinist conception of uh, of uh, dialectics. Everything is in flux. Everything is changing. Old quarrels with the new elements, etc. The late uh, Stalinist conception somehow uh, shifted towards uh, more stable 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 um, uh, elements because he thinks now that uh, perhaps there are some. Uh, some things that uh, do not change so quickly, not through like explosions. Uh, and uh, his model now is not organism, but I would say rather geological structure, yeah, or a layer. So, and we have different layers that changed in different speeds, and uh, there are some persistent uh, layer which Stalin um, uh, calls grammar or language yeah which cannot be accounted for within the framework historical of historical materialism it like falls out of this uh, of this scope and uh, we can like make this uh, st stable stable um, uh, structure or structures grammatical structure or a logical structure, the object of, uh, of our inquiry. Yeah? And uh, this, uh, I think at the end of 50s and beginning of, or end of the 40s and beginning of the 50s, uh, provoked uh, certain, uh, certain shifts within East Central European and Soviet uh, Marxism. Uh, it was the turn towards studying you know, logic and uh, dialectics or the formal and semantical part of language and of our thought. Yeah? So uh, this was like one direction uh, which uh, of this methodolog methodological term. Yeah? Uh, Marxists were not engaged in, uh, in alienation, in a theory of crisis, in concrete societies, yeah? but they were engaged in the ways how we conceptualize, how we think about societies, how we uh, categorize reality and so on. So we have uh, many like logics uh, written at that time. We have uh, Marxists who were engaged in an in inquiry of uh, the theory of categories, uh, etc. But it was like uh, partly a positive assessment of late Stalin's uh, contribution to 
to uh, philosophy, if we can <laughs> call it uh, like that. But there was also another uh, output uh, that has been provoked uh, rather by uh, reception of Gramsci, Lukács, yeah? uh, Marx's thesis on Feuerbach, uh, early Marx, I mean, this economic philosophical manuscripts. And this uh, uh, tended more towards concreteness. Yeah? So now the object of interest became real society, real dialectics that's happening uh here and now yeah within the society and um, we have like uh, many various again directions within this uh, framework of uh, the methodological turn towards real dialectics and uh, one of them is represented i uh, think by uh by karel kosik uh, kosik's dialectics of the concrete also uh, although uh, I should perhaps add that uh, back in 50s, he was also engaged in these discussions uh, concerning the logic and the theory of categories, as well as, uh, as uh, within the discussions that were concerned with the logic of Marx capital. Yeah? So, and by the way, this was another uh, influence, important influence at that time, Lenin's uh, philosophical notebooks, yeah? that uh, if you read it, there are, uh, there's not so much Lenin, yeah, but uh, nevertheless, these small parts, uh, Lenin uh, has written uh, on the edge of the of these uh, pages, uh, became sort of you know uh, material for further elaboration. Yeah, so if I could compare it to something, it I would say it uh, it's comparable to some fragment of Presocratics. Yeah, and Marxist philosophers just. Uh, try to show that uh, there is some uh, some richness in these you know uh, fragments and of course they turned it against uh, early stalinist conception in the sense that uh, they say see lenin uh, appraised hegel and you can see uh, stalin uh, listed four features of uh, of the dialect dialectics and uh, by uh, lenin you have some i don't know 16 or 18 yeah so uh, and there is negation of negation and so on. So it was used in this in this polemical way. And I think this uh, methodological turn uh, can be viewed as a general framework uh, from which uh, Kosik's dialectics of the concrete uh, arose. Thanks, thanks a lot, Ivan. I think it's it's uh, it's really valuable for people to to get past the kind of stereotype that nothing interesting was thought under Stalinism and then out of nowhere came these interesting philosophers like Kosik, but but in fact there was a quite there, there was a dynamic uh, to intellectual Stalinism as you called it and uh, maybe we could say that Kosik was was able to capture this and express it in in an original way but he took a lot of the the elements you mentioned, both from within intellectual Stalinism and from these other uh, out, other sources like Lukács and and um, and yeah, people reading Lenin's uh, notebooks, as well as Marx's um, uh, 1844 manuscripts, which are also coming into the picture in these these times, um, and Gramsci. Yeah, so. Uh, but maybe this would be a good time for me to turn to uh, Monica and Georgi to ask how how you might compare this situation uh, to developments in the areas where where you specialize, um, parallel developments, but also you know what what seems a bit different from the Czechoslovak case as represented by Karol Kosik. Uh, maybe Monica, you could start. Um, yeah, I will start uh, with a few words about general situation in Poland and then a few words about Cossack's reception, maybe. Uh, so basically, I feel what Ivan said to a certain degree applies to, to the whole region uh, and especially maybe in Poland, because in Poland, the analytical and, uh, and logic, chronologic traditions were very strong. Uh, so the late Stalinist uh, opening of the, of the 
problematic some linguistics and uh, and logic uh, were met very enthusiastically by people like Schaff and uh, uh, and by the representatives of, uh, of Warsaw School, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Uh, but in the same time, I think Poland maybe even earlier than uh, different countries uh, developed also this. Uh, uh this humanist current around uh 50 1955 1956 with people like uh like and like Kowalski. uh but at that time it did not produce a book as significant as uh as Cossacks. uh when it comes to to the reception of of Cossack uh, in Poland, it, it was very limited to, to put it in nice terms. Of course, there were so, certain points of encounters between Polish Marxists and Polish philosophers in general and Cossack. One of them was 1964 conference on the Slavic reception of, of Hegel in Warsaw. Uh, the own countries between Warsaw uh, School of, of History of Ideas and uh, and Kosik and also Patochka. Uh, also from famous, uh, of course, Socialist Humanist was also uh, a, a project that was shared by, um, by them. But uh, there was no serious engagement with Cossack thought. And I think if we are looking for reasons behind that, uh, there are several. First one is uh, is political, obviously, especially after 1968, it was quite problematic to refer to, to, refer to Cossack. Uh, but also there were infra I would say that the Kowakowski's Marxist period ended quite early uh, and uh, uh, ended quite early. And for, for people like Schaff, who later sort of developed uh, the strand or like Kuczynski's, they were uh, coming from different philosophical backgrounds, uh, more connected to, uh, to the analytical traditions on one hand, and this sort of uh, uh, doing philosophy, or, uh, and in Schaff's case, more uh from uh, dialogue with, with existentialists, especially Saad, who was quite important after 1956 in, uh, in Poland, and, was trying to like actively engage in in the discussions in the political discussions of that time. Uh, this absence of like serious engagement with Cossack uh, is also quite puzzling because the end of 1960s and 1970s are a period of of some discussions about uh, the possibility of uh, of dialogue between phenomenology and uh, and Marxism that are connected mostly to the works of Jan Szewczyk. Uh but he was not uh, he was mostly referring to Husserl and to Roman Gardner was a, a Polish phenomenologist of a more realistic current of, of phenomenology uh, rather than to, to, to Heidegger. Thanks. Um, yeah, so well, let's turn it over to Georgi and then I'll have some questions for both of you. Okay, <clears throat> so um, yeah, uh, first, uh, thanks for the invitation and for this volume, which is uh, really amazing uh, because uh, uh, in my case, it kind of was effective because I haven't read uh, Cossack before, but uh, this was the reason I read the Electric of the Concrete uh, along with the volume and I got really excited. So. Uh, I'm a bit have this enthusiasm of a neophyte a little bit, so I'm a little bit of a convert, I guess. So about the Bulgarian case, I, dis, I guess similar tendencies uh, could be found here as well, but that were already mentioned. 
And I would just say here that um, in this, uh, let's say um, in the 60s, this uh, shift towards uh, uh, kind of critiques of uh, intellectual Stalinisms, maybe, and so on and so forth here, uh, the big enemy maybe was uh, theory of reflection uh, and uh, Todor Pavlov, because uh, he was a big figure. Uh, and there was, but there were many uh, directions after the 60s where this uh, uh, anti Stalinism uh, appeared. And we also, there was also this shift towards uh, young Marx, ethical Marx, uh, um, and some kind of Marxist humanisms. However, it is important to note that not always, uh, uh, in our case in Bulgaria, uh, not always uh, humanism was necessarily uh, uh, um, very critical. Uh, and in sometimes it was like very mainstream as well. It was adopted by the mainstream by the, uh, after the 60s in 70s and 80s, it became kind of part of uh, official ideology in some ways with some kind of strange twists. Like for example, the daughter of Todor Zhivkov, general secretary of communist party, she was very much into humanism, but she mixed it with like uh, esoteric ideas. And uh, there was this, uh, that we have to fight alienation with meditation, Hinduism and so on and so forth, yoga, uh, became popular and things like this. It was also mixed with uh, some uh, uh, reactionary nationalist ideas, but this existed also not only in political field, but also in thinking. And uh, yeah, there is a great study by Zivka Valevicharska Restless History about Bulgarian uh, humanism and some reactionary elements uh, uh, it uh, contained. However, uh, this humanist turn was also accompanied in the 60s with a shift towards more uh, consumer society, light industries, and so on. So the uh, the um, uh, government they had to they had the urge to develop certain forms of production of knowledge that can regulate uh, this uh, uh, transition towards consumer society, and this led to the uh, institutionalization of sociology, for example, studies in to um, uh, quality of life. But also this, I'm talking now also about 70s, not only 60s, uh, in quality of life and also uh, everyday life. And this was like a mainstream funding for everyday life, which allowed certain critical thinkers to uh, carve a space uh, as precisely for this dialogue uh, between phenomenology and Marxism, um, which was very uh, interesting and productive. Uh, uh, even though after 89, it still ex continued to exist, but it rather manifested itself, not necessarily in philosophy, but in sociology, in critical uh, theory and sociology, sociological departments, for example, were, Created on this basis, and for Kosik himself, he was read in uh, like late 70s, 80s in English in National Library, uh, but uh, he was not the most influential, uh, perhaps, uh, author for this, uh, let's say, critical uh, uh, Marxists that existed at that time and who, who were combining um, phenomenology and um, and Marxism. But uh, at the same time, he was seen as a figure of a larger area of uh, uh, socialist uh, Marxists. And because uh, here more influential were um, uh, some Soviet Marxists like Ilenkov and Amamardashvili especially. And this is actually a question for you because uh, I, I think this would be very interesting to, because uh, this was something that uh, the I, I really like the book that it kind of maps out this uh, intellectual influence of Kosik. But uh, for example, uh, uh, it would have been interesting also to think more of these Eastern influences because Mamardashvili himself, he uh, lived in Prague uh, between 61 and 66. Uh, and here, at least the way this story is told, that uh, Mamardashvili was influenced by, uh, by Kusik and stepped on his theories and uh, reading uh, uh, Dialectic of the Concrete. Uh, it's um, for me because uh, I am more familiar with the Bulgarian, let's say, critical uh, Marxist uh, uh, appropriation of phenomenology, let's put it like this. Uh, and reading him, it was really amazing because it was like reading things that uh, have been written here. Like there are many uh, elements which uh, sound very similar. Like for example, the idea that we cannot penetrate directly through phenomenon, but we have to go through a detour. Here, the Bulgarian uh, Marxists of this style, they would, uh, through Mamardashvili, they would say, we have to, you have to surprise the uh, phenomenon behind its back. And uh, meaning the same also the critique, because it's, I would say this uh, dialogue between phenomenology and uh, Marxism, it's 
it's I think very similar in Kosik and, uh, and what they were doing here. So it's such a such a dialogue that uh, a phenomenologist would say they are too Marxist, and the Marxists would say they are too phenomenological. But <clears throat> at the same time, I think it's very interesting materialist reading of phenomenological questions, like for example, these critiques of um, the uh, that uh, this, especially in Husserl, let's say uh, the idea that. Uh, 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 consciousness is always intentionality for something, uh, but this presupposes some very abstract uh, subject, transhistorical and so on and so forth. But in Kusik also this, uh, he poses this idea that together with uh, uh, intentionality for something, we have to ask intentionality of who, where, and how the pre-predicated suppositions of uh, uh, thinking, let's say, are historically and socially constructed and so on and so forth. So uh, it poses this uh, this problem in a materialist uh, way. Uh, so yeah, this is like very, very similar to what was um, done here. And yeah, one, one last point I would like to say for this uh, reception, not of Kosik himself, but maybe of his influence, let's say, through Mamardashvili. Uh, I think, uh, yeah, what is important, I think, in this uh, discussion is to say that here, maybe this was not necessarily done uh, from the perspective of humanism. Not that humanism was not important, but I guess uh, this was not uh, especially political humanism, let's say, it, or, or uh, theoretical humanism, I mean, especially because I think uh, other questions were more uh, interesting for this critical Marxist that I'm uh, talking about precisely. For example, a big focus was to um, uh, have this, as I said, materialist uh, kind of um, uh, re-reading of uh, phenomenology in a way to see how um, a phenomenon and a world of appearances are also objective, like uh, this concept of uh, uh, pseudo-concrete and so on, for example, it's very similar to what uh, people were doing here, even though they did not use this uh, concept. And yeah, but yeah, we'll finish here. That again, for his influence is perhaps not direct, but through Soviet uh, Marxism. And I think it's uh, the, the volume is also very useful in this uh, kind of a project to uh, reconstruct the whole kind of um, uh, ecology of uh, critical thinking among the East, uh, which is something that uh, I think is very important because now we are kind of presented with a, in the mainstream with a view that uh, there is only Western Marxism and there is no socialist Marxism and so on. Yeah. Thanks. You, you've all raised some, some really important questions about how, how different forms of Eastern Marxism uh, emerged. I think in the co case of Kosik, we see it's also at the it's kind of a pivot between Eastern and certainly influenced by aspects of Western Marxism. But, but yeah, one side of this process seems to be uh, an internal dynamic of Eastern Marxism, Marxism-Leninism uh, in the philosophical field, which develops uh, in somewhat different ways in each country, which is, which is also interesting. Like you, you uh, Georgi, raised the, the the important position of Pavlov and his theory of reflection uh, in the Bulgarian case, whereas this is, I think it's a work that was influential throughout the region, but didn't have such a such a huge position in Czechoslovakia, for example. So there was, uh, so in each case, there was a negation of something different. And then there's also the relationships between these different places in Eastern and Central Europe. And uh, Georgi mentioned Ilyenkov. It's, it's interesting that Ilyenkov published a book in 1960 called The Dialectics of the Abstract and Concrete in Marx's Capital. Uh, and as far as I know, I don't know if uh, any of my co-editors have come up with anything uh, to, to uh, anything more on this. But as far as I know, we don't know of Kosik having read the work, even though he did read Russian and, and had studied it in the Soviet Union for some time. Um, so there are these overlaps that and that may be indirect influence, some cases maybe direct influence that just isn't cited. Um, uh, but then there's also the case of, of what I'm saying, ex, uh, influence external to Soviet and Eastern Marxism, like phenomenology, which is not an entirely Western phenomenon. In the case of uh, Czechoslovakia and Poland, there's a local phenomenological tradition. Actually, Husserl was from the Czech lands. 
uh, though he was no longer living there when he became a prominent phenomenologist. Um, so, and and since, although we will have a bigger question and answer period at the end for the audience, there was, I think, an apt question. Now, uh, Ralph Electwell has uh, asked, how did Kosi come into contact with phenomenology? So maybe I will pose that question to Ivan before we move, we move on to um, some, some, a later point in the historical discussion here. Well, so uh, I think there were uh, like two major influences, one of them negative and one of them positive. Yeah, And uh, the negative uh, influence uh, on Kosik, I mean, concerning phenomenology, uh, was Lukács. Yeah? Uh, he was uh, translated and uh, widely read back in 1950s, uh, the destruction of reason. Uh, and uh, this, I would say, middle Lukács uh, portrayed uh, phenomenology as some sort of you know, irrationalism. And uh, this um, picture of phenomenology somehow uh, blocked, or at least you know, uh, meant that uh, certain Marxists uh, had a distance towards phenomenology. Yeah? And uh, the situation was disblocked uh, by Jan Patočka, who was like famous uh, Czech phenomenologist, uh, the direct uh, um, student uh, of Heidegger and also Husserl. And uh, he had an immense influence on uh, these youngsters, on these Marxist uh, philosophers of the same generation, as he uh, worked at the same institute and uh, discussed uh, with them uh, both Husserl in, and Heidegger. Yeah, so uh, the main interlocutor was uh, was in this sense uh, Jan Patočka, and of course uh, uh, you can have different forms, you know, of the appropriation of phenomenology by Marxists. Yeah, some of them abandoned uh, Marxism altogether and turned towards phenomenology. It was one case, uh, case of Ivan Dubsky, for example. Uh, other Marxists uh, try to criticize uh, phenomenology from the Marxist or materialist points of point of view. That was uh, the case of uh, early uh, Kosik or Kosik of the Dialectics of the Concrete. And uh, of course, there were you know, different shapes of this phenomenological Marxism. It means uh, of these attempts to combine you know, both, both currents. And one of them uh, was uh, like more Husserlian and another one was more like Heideggerian. Yeah? And in this sense also depended uh, if, uh, these Marxists were inspired by being in time or by late Heidegger and his writings on technology. And I would say that uh, in case of Kosik, he made uh, during the like one decade, uh, influenced by Patochka, the, the, the change or shift from critical stance towards phenomenology, both Husserlian and uh, Heideggerian towards uh, the true like uh, phenomenological Marxism uh, of, of uh, Heideggerian stripe, yeah, because like 1968 onwards, he, uh, and maybe we'll talk about that later on, he just uh, revised uh, philosophy of praxis and uh, developed another conception, uh, Marxist philosophy of technology. Yeah, so that was the shift towards or, you know, not only Heideggerian idiom, but uh, he just tried to combine or to reinterpret certain Heideggerian figures, for example, of Gestell and so on, uh, through Marxian conceptual tools and vice versa. But that was the case of late, late Kosik. Yeah, thanks. Um... That I think that that's maybe a good moment to start looking at uh, the, the 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 way Kosik's uh, work was also received outside of of Central and Eastern Europe because it was in part as as an interpreter of Heidegger as a Heideggerian Marxist according to some or. Marxist critic of Heideggerianism. There's an ongoing debate about uh, whether to understand Kosik and the dialectics of the concrete as 
someone who is phenomenological in his approach or anti-phenomenological, but but interpreting it in in um, innovative ways. And that's um, that was uh, actually very influential in the 60s and 70s as the dialectics of the concrete began to be translated into various languages. And um, uh, so, yeah, I don't, if, if you want to, Ivan, say a little bit more about this international reception outside of, of Eastern Europe. And maybe why, why you think this book that was for, for Eastern Europeans, it was often taken as uh, a critique of society in this place and time, um, a powerful uh, breaking through some in new, new kinds of philosophy, but also new ways of, of understanding possibilities for reforming society and humanizing socialism and so on how this spoke to audiences in, in a different moment, different context anyway. Okay, uh, well, <laughs> this is a very difficult question because in each country, uh, the, the reasons for uh, appraisal of the dialectics of the concrete could be, could be different. But if I would uh, like uh, give you a general picture, uh, I would is assume that one of the reasons was precisely uh, the fact that um, Kosik was in this book uh, trying to tackle certain problems that were simply in the air, not only in East Central Europe, but also in France or Italy and so on. So uh, as we have spoken about um, attempts at combining phenomenology and Marxism, uh, we can see, for example, in Italy, you know, this Melanese school of, uh, of phenomenological Marxism uh, was pretty much going in the same direction. Yeah, and uh, the same can be uh, set uh, of uh, the situation in uh, Germany or, or uh, France. Yeah, so, uh, but I think there were also, you know, uh, other elements of this work because uh, maybe it will sound as a banality, yeah, but uh, this dialectics of the concrete this book uh, is a philosophical book yeah so and it means that <laughs> it it tries to be about everything yeah so it tries to give you some you know general philosophical theory and it has many it's like uh, short in uh, in pages it's like uh, 150 170 pages but uh, it is full of like ideas and um, many of these ideas are not not uh, elaborated in uh, in sufficient detail yeah so uh, there is many there are many things to to pick up and uh, uh, follow up and uh, in different countries different thinkers were uh, somehow you know impressed by different pieces yeah of of uh, these uh, of this philosophical theory but uh, i would say that um, it concerns phenomenological Marxism, yeah. Uh, there was certain uh, trend that that leaned towards, you know, reinterpretation of materialism or proper understanding of materialism, yeah. And uh, there was this, you know, uh, widespread idea that materialism can mean simply the uh, the claim that reality is independent of uh, our consciousness, yeah? Uh, nevertheless, we can uh, get some good knowledge of the reality, uh, scientific knowledge, et cetera, yeah? So th this was the like widespread uh, idea that uh, stood behind uh, the term materialism. And uh, many thinkers, not only in East Central Europe and not only Kosik, just uh, uh, were attracted by another conception of materialism that was proposed in thesis on Feuerbach. Yeah? And uh, this sort of materialism precisely criticized uh, the former conception of materialism as something that is independent of, of us, of human beings. Yeah? And uh, it uh, gives us another different picture that we are part of this reality. We are also real. We are also material, yeah, although conscious. And uh, we are also uh, in some way uh, like participating on the formation of, of reality, 
Yeah. And this idea, I think, was something that um, fascinated uh, many, many thinkers at that time. And even in France, you know, uh, there was this phenomenologist, uh, Desanti, and he precisely said that in Marx, we have a certain epochal turn in the sense that uh, whereas, you know, in, uh, in uh, Greece, you have this ontology focused on being uh, in uh, like modern philosophy, you have this turn towards consciousness. Then by Marx, you have this turn towards, uh, you know, uh, praxis, towards, you know, uh, practical en engagement of uh, human beings that are both, you know, uh, biological entities, material entities, uh, and conscious entities and self-conscious entities, yeah. So uh, I think this was something that attracted many, many thinkers uh, abroad. Thanks. Uh, maybe be before we go on to uh, the questions I have for Monica and Georgi, I, I'll just raise a couple more about phenomenology that were um, posed by the audience because, well, well, we're still somewhat on that topic. Um, if you want to, first of all, so first, Ian Angus, who's one of our authors in the edited volume, and I forgot at the beginning to give a shout out to our authors. I hope, I hope um, several of you are in the audience, but I don't actually see who the audience is, um, the downside of, of uh, these, some of these online events. But um, so, Glad to have Ian Angus here. And uh, uh, yeah, he, he's asking uh, about the differences between the reception of Husserl and Heidegger, which, which you mentioned um, earlier in passing. And then Ralph Electro also asked about Patochka. If you just clarify Patochka's relationship to Kosik, which is, I think, a question a lot of people, Patochka being the, the one Czech philosopher of the 20th century, even better known than Kosik. Uh, this will be a question on a lot of people's minds. So this is for, for Ivan. OK, so uh, the first question was about, about the re relation of uh, Patochka and Kosik. Yeah? So, um, well, I would say there was some like uh, ongoing uh, debate between Kosik and, and Patochka. And as I've already mentioned, uh, Patochka was uh, uh, perhaps, you know, the most important uh, interlocutor who, who introduced uh, Husserl and Heidegger to, to these uh, young Marxists. Yeah? And uh, if I take, you know, uh, just this internal debate between Patochka and uh, and uh, Kosik, so uh, the topic of their uh, interchange uh, was the proper understanding, you know, of the philosophy of praxis. So uh, can we take it as an alternative, Marxist alternative, towards uh, Heideggerian fundamental ontology? Yeah? So is it possible to uh, take praxis as a central category that uh, is just, you know, basic category from which we can uh, develop uh, the, the other web of, of, uh, of categories. Yeah? And uh, in Heideggerian fundamental ontology, uh, the, 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 the basic category yeah, uh, is being understood as a, as a time or as a temporality. Yeah? And uh, I think that in dialectics of a concrete, uh, Kosik tried to show that uh, uh, temporality or human time uh, is derived from uh, human praxis. And in this sense, uh, you know, you have similar uh, um, attempts uh, made, uh, for example, by Soviet Marxists. Uh, I mean, this activity approach, yeah. Uh, for, for example, Leontiev, uh, philosoph philosopher and psychologist, who uh, also was somehow fascinated uh, with, uh, with the possibility that we can derive uh, certain you know uh, uh, functions of the consciousness from the fact that human being is practical being that it's not only you know some Leibnizian monad that has you know only the the series of perceptions and apperceptions going on in uh, her or his head yeah of this monad uh, but we have you know uh, 
bodily persons that are engaged and were forming uh, reality. Yeah. So this was, and this of course has a big, you know, uh, impact of uh, developing of certain, you know, uh, cognitive functions and uh, the sense of time and so on. So, uh, but coming back to Patočka, uh, Patočka somehow, you know, in this dialogue with uh, with Kosik, uh, defended uh, this Heideggerian uh, fundamental ontological conception of uh, temporality as a sense of, you know, being that uh, somehow uh, makes our practical coping with things and our, you know, practical engagement uh, in the reality uh, ontologically possible. Yeah. Great, and maybe we'll, we'll come back to the question of Heidegger versus Husserl in the later discussion period, uh, because I do, I do want to make sure to uh, give uh, the floor now to Monica and then to Georgi with a question I have for both of you, which is reading reading Kosik and about Kosik, these interpretations of Kosik today uh, from a philosophical perspective of someone trying to develop critical understanding of our society and, and our world. Uh, what, do you, what do you take as still, still relevant today and where would you see the need maybe for critical engagements or pointing out limitations with Kosik's work or the, the interpretations of Kosik that, that we've published in this book. So, Monica. Okay, I'm still, am I muted? No, uh, okay, great. Um, that is a very important question. I. I think when we look at the book itself, it it somehow hints what interests like beyond historical thing. And I think it's mostly understanding of materialism and the practical understanding of it on one hand and the notion of concrete. Sorry, just to reality. clarify, you mean this book we've published or you mean Kossi? Yeah, no, 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 I, I mean, your volume, not uh, uh, not dialectics of the concrete. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, so I, I would say understanding of materialism, the practical understanding of materialism, uh, which is, uh, I know that for, for some people it might seem quite obvious, but uh, when we, especially Central Europe, uh, but also when we, I don't know, teach students this sort of mechanistic, uh passive understanding of matter uh is still very uh very popular and uh, attributed to uh, to marxism in, in general let's say uh so that would be one thing and the second thing would be the the notion of uh, of concrete uh, of concrete totality so I, I would say that the questions that are important for uh for the methodology of marxism itself uh, which gives them, of course, the uh, the importance uh, for everybody who, who wants to uh, to understand Marxism and to to, to do critical theory today. Uh, and beyond that, probably the the question of temporality. Although I I think that it was. Uh, it is developed in a today in in a slightly different uh, direction in in things like uh, like uh, Massimiliano Stompa's uh, work, but uh, when it comes to critical engagement, I, I, I think the I think actually Jan Merver's text is. Uh, is doing what I think we kind of uh, should do, or uh, it's it's worth doing, which is to um, to ask about the uh, the sort of other political uh, subjects that were 
not fully included in that project, I would say so. Uh, project of Marxist humanists. The in... project of Marxist humanists. And if I might, uh, just to follow up what uh, Georgi said before, in Poland also uh, socialist humanism became in in sixties, but especially in seventies, a sort of official official doctrine that was basically legitimizing the the changes in in socialism. So that is very uh, that is very important, uh, and the. The sort of practical turn against the theory of reflection was also present. So I think both of those can be treated as a as a wider uh, as a wider phenomenon. And now I'll turn to Georgi. Um, yeah, what do you take from from these interpretations of Kosik? So, uh, to my mind, I think at least. Uh, at least for me, at least two things are uh, very relevant in his work. And first is, uh, I think uh, uh, his work and the volume as well can uh, facilitate the more adequate understanding of Marx himself. And Marx will be uh, relevant until we live in uh, capitalism. I, I, at least this is what I suppose. And what I mean by more adequate uh, understanding of Marx is that um, there were these questions now about the different encounters between Marxism and phenomenology and different types of phenomenologies and so on and so forth. But uh, perhaps, and this was already mentioned, but perhaps we have to suppose that uh, this encounter uh, between Marx and phenomenology already somehow happened before it happened in Marx himself. Not only his uh, critique of Feuerbach and uh, his critique of this naive uh, uh, materialism uh, uh, in uh, Feuerbach, what Marx called new, mater uh, new materialism and so on, but also in Capital itself, we can find uh, 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 an understanding of uh, uh, Capital uh, that does not necessarily get rid of uh, consciousness and pra pra practice as well. A and <clears throat> uh, in the sense that uh, Capitalism in the, in the end of the day is a system that is reproduced through the, let's say, self-evidences and uh, obvious uh, kind of appearances and so on and so forth, illusions and so on. They are as well objective and material in this sense. And uh, Marx all the time uses a language that allows itself to be uh, um, incorporated in certain dialogue between his work and phenomenology later. Uh, like uh, it appears to be from the perspective of all the time uh, he uses this kind of uh, language about uh, talking about the commodity as a sensuous, super sensuous, uh, talking about how um, uh, categories can, uh, are uh, socially valid, uh, valid and uh, therefore uh, objective uh, forms of thinking and so on and so forth. So this uh, more uh, non-mechanistic uh, understanding of materialism is also in uh, capital itself. So I think, yeah, this uh, reading of uh, Kosi can uh, help us uncover uh, these elements in uh, uh, capital also, not only in early Marx and so on. And I think here we could think of some kind of a possibility to uh, unite these two uh, strands that were mentioned before this that diverge between let's say studies of logic of capital in this kind of mechanistic way and then uh, studies in a real dialectic studying to young Marx and so on we could think of some praxeological let's say uh, uh, turn as well uh, that can you un understand praxis uh, in a kind of uh, as a kind of in ontological terms but still uh, take into account that uh, forms of appearances and illusions and uh, the uh, reified forms of practice and so forth and so on are constitutive of social reality and this can uh, we can find in uh, Marx and um, and second reason I think uh, uh, his Kosik uh, is relevant today and especially this uh, volume that uh, uh, you have done uh, is what I mentioned before the uh, could be part of a reconstruction of uh, a critical socialist thinking, which is uh, more than relevant uh, today, not only for historical reasons to uncover that uh, we uh, in the East also had uh, original thinking, but this the position of this thinking was very specific because uh, it had to, uh, uh, on the one hand, uh, retain critique of capitalism, but uh, crit uh, to criticize its own society, and this allows for a, a larger, maybe, uh, critique of uh, 
modernity, let's say, or at least maybe not of modernity in all cases, but of certain modernist dogmas that uh, expect uh, a constant progress and so on and so forth. So I think this is more than relevant today, especially in the light of environmental crisis and so on and so forth. And these Marxists that I mentioned that have read a little bit um, uh, now they still work and uh, they go precisely in these directions to think of uh, 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 some kind of a critique, uh, not only of um, uh, also critique of capitalism that unites critique of, um, uh, of the environmental crisis that we're all facing. Yeah. And that's it, I'll say. Okay, thanks. Um, and maybe just uh, before we go to the audience's questions, if I don't know if Ivan wants to add anything to that or respond. Uh, um, we have also the, there is the, the question Monica raised about whether Kosik and other Marxist humanists left out too many, uh, or what they assumed the human being was and which subjects were forgotten or how, how this universal human didn't necessarily uh, uh, wasn't as universal as it should have been um, if women or or colonial subjects or or even within a, a state like Czechoslovakia, if all Czechoslovak citizens were human to the same degree in this this um, in this understanding, I think that's that's a uh, yeah that is uh, an important question to to raise. Uh, but yeah, did did you want to say anything more, Ivan? Well, maybe uh, this is the point um, Monica could elaborate a little bit on yeah, uh, about this uh, subject or subjectivities that uh, were somehow uh, remained outside the framework of this humanist version of Marxism. Yeah, Monica. Mm -hmm. I think the list you gave is the, is valid, but I I meant mostly that what what Jan said, and that is uh, that is mostly workers and uh, how workers as a subject are uh, are represented in the book and how they were represented in in Cossacks sort of public activity in, in general. Workers being represented, but not not directly given voice uh, enough. Is that how you put it? I think that is a, 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 a mild, a, 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 a still maybe too mild formulation. I don't know, maybe it's a good time to give voice to Jan. Uh, yeah, well, Jan, do you want to say anything? You're here with us, so if you want to jump in. Well, briefly, hi, everyone. Well, as far as I could see, it's not only Kosi's case, but the case of all uh, uh, Marxist humanists in uh, Czechoslovakia and maybe in the region. Uh, what we can observe here is, uh, is mostly the same uh, uh, story as, as Nikolai Karkov uh, described in the case of, 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 of the praxis school, right? So you have this like very universal definition of human being and out of that are coming is, is, is the ethnicities uh, that is to be said that uh, there are certain groups that are not seen or seen in, 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 in a certain way uh, uh, that uh, uh, is uh, not further interpreted. So it's not only about workers, but also about women. It's about the superiority of the part of the Europe that Kosik uh, and other philosophers and intellectuals are coming from. Uh, that means Central Europe as, as the most Western part of the whole region of Eastern Europe. And, uh, and uh, uh, the, the way how the, let's say, the, the gender inequality is not seen in their work is also connected to this. So uh, I would say it's a, it's a general problem of, of the whole uh, notion of, of Marxismism, which would be, which would call for, for a further comparative perspective, maybe. Well, maybe at this point, I, I really should get to some of the questions from the audience. Um, we already have a couple that have accumulated and I'll now encourage 
those of you who are holding back to, to go ahead and write your questions into the chat. Um, so, uh, well, we, we still have the question about differentiating Husserl from Heidegger, although I think Ivan said a little bit about that earlier. So I'll leave that open whether um, anyone wants to get back to that. But th we do have a prov provocative question from Karina Lotz, um, who asks whether um, the term Stalinist dialectics is an oxymoron, um, which I think this was directed at Ivan, but also I know Monica has perhaps studied something that arguably could be considered dialectics coming out of the Stalinist intellectual tradition. If either of you want to respond to this, is there such a thing as dialectics in Stalinist thought, of real dialectics, I suppose, is the implication? Well, uh, what I've been talking about was uh, Stalinist conception yeah, of, of dialectics, and I would uh, uh, claim that uh, he certainly had some conception uh, of dialectics, and the question is uh, if it's you know original or eclectic, if it's only you know mix of uh, Plekhanov's and I don't know Bogdanov's view that he just put together and uh, somehow you know reproduced a certain version of. Uh, of uh, commonly accepted uh, view of dialectics. Yeah. But uh, what I think, you know, interesting uh, was, and that's why I have been spoken about um, the Stalinist conception of, of dialectics, uh, that uh, there is certain, you know, uh, shift and there are two dialectics which are completely different. And uh, of course, uh, it closely relates to uh, Stalinist, you know, understanding of revolution, yeah? and uh, of course, you know, also by Kosick and other Marxists from the 1950s, uh, concrete dialectics was always uh, connected to, you know, social upheavals and uh, social revolutions and so on. And what I wanted to stress is just uh, if you model, you know, dialectics uh, on uh, the model of organism. Yeah, and if you model it uh, on uh, the model of geological structure, you have totally different conceptions of dialectics and also of revolution. And the second conception is uh, like more conservative that, uh, than the first one, because uh, the understanding of revolution uh, as an explosion is somehow certain you know, development within society that can last for, I don't know, 10, 100 years squeezed into one moment when uh, the like radical change uh, in society occurs. If you have this idea of uh, you know geological structure and uh, ge geological structures are uh, changing you know across thousands and millions of years, then the social change is somehow expanded in time and uh, you have the small evolution that lasts a long time, but the effect is the same as if you would squeeze it and in the moment of explosion. Yeah. And uh, I think this you know, model of thinking about dialectics was quite important, uh, not only for Stalin, but uh, especially for those intellectuals who we are talking about Kosik yeah, as a philosopher of praxis. But he was also Stalinist at some point of his uh, intellectual biography, and many were, yeah, Stalinists. And uh, those people just were thinking uh, with the help of these models. Yeah, so uh, that's why I would uh, uh, I would be talking about intellectual Stalinism as certain you know phenomenon that uh, uh, can be um, accounted for in isolation from, for example, Stalinism as economic doctrine or Stalinism as a, as a certain, you know, social form. Yeah. Uh, although, of course, uh, this intellectual Stalinism has much to do with, uh, with the politics because uh, the part of this intellectual Stalinism is certain understanding of Leninism. Yeah. And uh, this was also, you know, a topical question back in 50s because 
when these intellectuals like Kosik, the former Stalinist, tried to distance themselves from, from Stalinism, uh, they would uh, do it uh, uh, with the transparent back to Leninism. Yeah? And uh, of course, Leninism was invention of Stalin and Stalinism. So there were somehow, somehow you know, clashes between two different conceptions of, of, uh, of Leninism and uh, in uh, Stalinist framework, it was, of course, something, you know, quite uh, instrumental. It was sort of, you know, theory of political action. Yeah. And uh, by, by uh, these philosophers of praxis, uh, this was something, uh, something quite different. And uh, uh, it was another kind of, of Leninism. Yeah. So I don't know if I've answered the question, but uh, at least uh, uh, I cleared up uh, why I am talking about Stalin Stalinist conception of dialectics. If I may follow up and maybe uh, get to the second question, second Kurinara's question. I, I generally agree with, with Ivan, there's definitely a concept of dialectics of what does it mean for Stalin that the materialist is dialectical. Of course, if we understand dialectics as a sort of Marx method of inquiry, we can argue that there is no such thing. But uh, in the sense we, we were talking about, I, I do agree with Ivan. And I also think that it, it is very important what he said about philosophers who worked in that framework. We have uh, a number of... Uh, of philosophers who were basically a source of positivist philosophers of nature, let's say, who were developing and trying to develop the objectivistic framework of uh, of dialectical materialism. People like like Helena Einstein in in Poland. So, uh, so I think it it is important to uh, to treat it as of course, from the point of view of Marxist as critical theory is a vulgarized version, but from the point of view of history of philosophy, it is uh, it is important that it had some uh, it was a source of some uh, philosophical projects or texts. Uh, and when it comes to Ilyenkov, uh, I don't know if maybe even encountered something. I don't know about any any direct encounter. I haven't met any reference to Kosik in in Ilyenkov. Uh, I I do think that the only person who could give a full answer to that is is Andrei Maidansky because he's probably the only person who knows the the archives. Uh, so it is possible that there is something we we don't know about. Uh, well, well, if I can follow up, uh, I think that uh, there is um, a recent uh, interview with uh, Andrei Maidansky, who actually um, mentions that uh, he found, or there is something in the archive, some, I don't know if it's a list of, uh, of uh, read books, or books read by, by Ilyenkov, uh, but uh, it seems that he was acquainted with, uh, with uh, Kosik's Dialectics of the Concrete, which he read in, uh, in German language, it's by the way very interesting yeah. that uh, there was this reception uh, of you know what was going on in East Central Europe, uh, strange reception uh, in Soviet Union because uh, you have no translation of Dialectics of the Concrete of uh, Robert Kalivoda uh, book about uh, psychoanalytical Marxism of Gardavsky, God is not dead and so on. So there are many uh, interesting, important books that had casted some influence in Poland and uh, former Yugoslavia, Hungary, and so on, uh, but seemingly not in the Soviet Union. But nevertheless, these people were acquainted with uh, with uh, the, the intellectual happening in uh, not only in Czechoslovakia. And uh, of course, uh, Ilinkov, as Mamar Dashvili, who of course lived in Prague, for quite a long time, yeah. So, uh, but Ilyenkov visited Hegel, Hegel's Congress uh, in Prague back in 1966, I think. So uh, it's quite possible that they have. He was acquainted with uh, at least some of Marxist 
philosopher, especially those who uh, were also Hegel scholars. Yeah? But uh, concerning Ilyenkov's book, uh, published back in 1960, it's quite uh, you know probable that uh, that uh, Kosik read this book because Inzig Zeleny uh, uh, like cites this book and read this book and so on. So I think there was some uh, um, acquaintance with and familiarity with uh, with the production uh, at the Soviet Union. I mean. Of course, there was there was this official, you know, uh, these official authors and so on. Uh, but uh, also, the the authors that were viewed by, for example, officials at Soviet Union as a as a marginal, they were also, you know, uh, read and uh, and uh, received uh, in in Czechoslovakia. Mm -hmm. And uh, concerning the the Mamardashvili, I think it's you know. Very fascinating story, his you know uh, presence here uh, in Prague. Of course, uh, it was not only Mamar Dashvili, but uh, the whole group of people who uh, worked here uh, at this uh, communist international journal. Uh, um, uh, I forgot the name now. Aproximira uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. And uh, those people, uh, you know, became quite prominent intellectuals. Uh, and it's very interesting that uh, back in 1950s, they were also involved uh, within this you know, discussion about logic of Marx capital on the one side, and on the other side, uh, on these you know, epistemological debates about the theory of categories and so on. Yeah? And uh, Boris Grushin, yeah? uh, he became later a sociologist, uh, but in the... 1950s, he he also you know was uh, involved in these discussions about uh, you know logical forms and uh, and categories. So uh, and it's no coincidence that uh, you know sociology, uh, this Marxist sociology, uh, arose from these you know debates about methodological uh, questions. Yeah, and uh, but Ivan Frolov, for example, it's another uh, type of intellectual who was more interested in in these, uh, um, you know, philosophy of nature, Marxist philosophy of nature. So uh, I think this is something that still waits for some, you know, uh, deep, deeper research. And uh, maybe it can be uncovered that uh, that there were some uh, some contacts and, and ties, even ties. By the way, I've uh, I've talked to, to Milan Brucha, yeah, who, the, who is still uh, the, the, the philosopher um, uh, born in 1930, who studied in in Soviet Union, and uh, actually he like kept some contacts with uh, these intellectual Russian or Soviet intellectuals uh, living at that time in Prague. And uh, he had, you know, impression this, that the, these were somehow, you know, like uh, Marxist ar aristocrats, yeah, because they could uh, travel. They they had a supply of of, uh, of uh, interesting literature from the West, yeah, and uh, so uh, in some sense they were somehow, you know, uh, prominence, yeah, and uh, maybe this could block some closer contact to to uh, Czech Marxist philosophers. But for example, Mamardashvili and uh, Grushin and others, they had a uh, like a movie club, yeah, so uh, organized by Antonin Lim. Yeah, so he certainly, uh, although not philosopher, uh, kept some some contact with them. Uh, yeah, this is there are a lot of the important things to trace about the the contacts and uh, influences back and forth. Uh, Georgi earlier earlier mentioned that Kosik was read in Bulgaria in the English translation so it's interesting and he makes it to the Soviet Union in the German translation at least in Ilyenkov's case. Um, so, uh, yeah th this is, these are fascinating points. Uh, maybe before we get to oh yeah Monica. The German edition was quite co common with Ilyenkov because he, we know that he read Schaff and Polish philosophers also in German. Uh, so it, it, it's not only Czech philosophy, uh, definitely. But I also would like to add something because we obviously we mentioned Capital and we mentioned manuscripts, but I also think that when it comes to Kosik and, and Dyankov and the affinities between them, the Grundriza is, is of, uh, of 
of great importance for this particular praxis oriented uh, strand of Marxism. So uh, that just a quick quick remark. Yeah, that's true. We haven't we haven't even talked about the Grundrisse, so but that was in in Kosi's case crucial and um, probably that would be an interesting to compare the influence of the Grundrisse in different parts of of Central and Eastern Europe. Um, I also, there's there's one question that came up before we get into some more specific questions about Kosik's later thought uh, that Yuri Ruzicka has posed, but first, um, Ralph Electual asked the question about the philosophy of the natural sciences versus, I suppose, maybe more humanistic philosophy um, and whether uh, it's the case, he's, as he writes, that uh, sometimes um, the philosophy of the natural sciences, especially with the thaw, was uh, was more developed as long as philosophers didn't challenge the basics of dogma. I, if I understand the question right, they they could be a little bit freer in their in the natural sciences. Um, whereas uh, we've been talking about philosophers who talk sometimes about the philosophy of science, but not only. So I don't know if there's any of you who want to mention this questions about the whole region, not only about Kosik, uh, the, the space for the philosophy of science versus other kinds of philosophy in uh, the period. Well, this is about after the thaw, but I think also this, at least in Czechoslovakia, after 1968 is another major moment when the, the the dynamics change. Any of the three of you want to speak up on this? Uh, just uh, can I say one sentence? Uh, the thing is about this challenging the basics of dogma. The thing is, uh, I think uh, <clears throat> the dogma was not so fixed uh, first. It was changing in time and it, there were many uh, porous places and kind of places of uncertainty and so on. And I don't know uh, about uh, natural sciences enough, but certainly there are good Soviet philosophers like Ilenkov, for example. I think it's in, I think uh, such a philosopher cannot exist in isolation. We can assume, and it's traceable, that he was part of a whole area, of a whole um, world of thinking, of critical thinking. And I think uh, it existed uh, everywhere in the East, of course, with some repressions, sometimes sometimes more heavy than others, sometimes lighter. Like in uh, the Bulgarian case, it was not so uh, serious, uh, especially uh, it was more serious against some people. But uh, yeah, it existed. As, uh, uh, Everywhere, and I think it's a kind of a political task even to to excavate this uh, critical thinking, this socialist, uh, original socialist Marxism, because it's a part of excavation of this world that was lost, I think. Uh, and yeah, I think it's important. Thanks. Uh, I would like maybe now to turn to to Kosik as he develops his own work later, which. Um, which does happen during both the period of increasing liberalization in Czechoslovakia, but then after uh, the Prague Spring ends and the reform process is, uh, is declared over and Kosik's position becomes much more tenuous. So, um, so there are two questions about Kosik's development here, but I'll, I'll First, go to Yuri Ruzicka, who asks um, about, uh, this is directed at Ivan, whether, whether Kosik really retreated even from his critique of Heidegger on the question of the practical or origin of temporality during the 1960s, the, what you said earlier, that, that temporality derives from praxis rather than temporality being fundamental. Um, so even if Heidegger became more, uh, Kosik became, more Heideggerian in some respects, did he retreat even from that position? And then the follow-up question that Yuri asks is uh, if this means a uh, retreat into idealism. So Ivan. Thank you, Yuri. Um, well, <clears throat> uh, 
perhaps yes so although i uh, cannot you know um, give you any any reference from the late Kosik, uh, but uh, i would imply that uh, he changed his view uh, on the foundation of uh, you know human temporality uh, in in uh, praxis uh, and I, I will explain in in what sense. Yeah, uh, it uh, relates to his, you know, rethinking or maybe redefinition of the concept of praxis. Because uh, in the dialectics of the concrete, when he's when he's talking about praxis, so uh, he has basically uh, in mind uh, not the soul coping with things. So. The, the instrumental action, but uh, onto creativity, yeah, the creation of something new, which uh, according to him uh, happens in uh, in labor, yeah, uh, in the sense it resembles, uh, according to him, you know, the artistic creation. Uh, uh, so not only you know the individual acts of labor when you produce for example a shoe yeah but uh, the act of labor when you somehow you know creatively go beyond certain limits of instrumental action and invent new type of use or new type of product and so on yeah so in labor is retained this this moment of onto creativity and another type of praxis is according to Kosik revolutionary praxis, yeah, where you like fundamentally change the structure of of uh, social reality. Yeah, so I would say this is the praxis with B, big uh, B. Yeah, it's a praxis in emphatic sense, which uh, I think after 1968, under influence of of uh, uh, Heidegger. Uh, rethinks and uh, there is some you know. Um, letter um i forgot by whom uh who uh reports about about uh Kossik's thought back in 1970s and uh, he states that uh he's you know focused on rethinking marx thesis on feuerbach yeah especially 11th thesis and uh he thinks we don't know what does it mean to uh, explain reality, to change reality. We don't know even what reality is. So he starts from scratch, from beginning. And uh, I think at that time he redefines his conception of praxis in this emphatic sense and focuses more on these, on these you know, uh, small practices, I would say. Something he criticizes in Dialectics of the, of the Concrete when he criticizes Heidegger, that praxis for Heidegger is only coping with things. Yeah? But the late uh, Kossik uh, thinks precisely that uh, we should focus on these small everyday practices. And although he thinks at the same time that these practices are somehow constitutive for our social environment. Yeah? So when we come together with the family at the table and enjoy the, the meal together, this is the small practice but his has you know immense uh meaning uh in keeping family together yeah or community so uh, these are certainly you know heideggerian references or allusions and uh, he combines this idea about you know small practices uh with the the idea of the role of technology in our you know Life world, yeah. So, uh, it's, by the way, very interesting to read uh, to read uh, these late Cossack texts uh, side by side with um, its uh, German-born American uh, uh, philosopher of technology Albert Borgmann, yeah. And uh, he precisely goes in the same direction as Cossack does. That uh, he's focusing on what he calls focal practices. So the practices that somehow bring our life to the focus yeah and uh, he gives you know examples of playing the music and uh, running uh, in the in the forest and so on so these are like a uh, small practices and then of course you can ask about uh, the temporality how temporality fits within this framework and also you know uh, what you know bigger or social impact uh, can this type of action 
have yeah and uh, of course uh, back in 1970s uh, when uh, for many dissidents uh, any you know big collective action was just you know fantasy they were precisely thinking about these you know small actions small practices that could be unnoticed in everyday life but uh, in some you know degree uh, an amount uh, they can uh, have or uh, enact some 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 change take for example Václav Havel you know uh, essay power of powerless yeah which goes precisely in this direction so we can you know uh, keep going and uh, do certain ritualized you know actions like putting the flags uh, from the window when there is you know uh, the first may or we can reject to do it yeah and when we reject to do it some other people see that we did not hang the flag outside and he doesn't do it as well so then the the something like collective subject although we don't know other people they are anonymous to us uh, is created which can have certain you know agency so this is uh, how these small practices can at the end have some social impact and uh, concerning the the temporality uh, of course you know the human type uh, time is not you know this natural time as a as a, as a you know natural param parameter yeah? so uh, we can have in you know practicing these small practices yeah a uh, certain uh, sense of time yeah which of course uh, is not uh, not um, comparable to to this uh, fundamentally ontological uh, view of temporality proposed by heidegger in in, uh, in the early work being in time uh i think monica has a question for ivan but i will just quickly respond to ralph intellectual's question about whether these late texts by kosik are available in english um there has there's a translation of Kosik's writings from the 1960s, uh, but but um, I would say it's even that it has some problems. But um, a lot of the most of the later texts are not available in English yet. But we hope to uh, at the institute to prepare some of those for publication in English. So hopefully others will be able to read some of the stuff that. Ivan has been referring to. Um, uh, Monica, you wanted to ask something? Yeah, I wanted to ask if this is a question to Ivan. Uh, do you think that this uh, turn into a, everyday small practices uh, is just a sign of defeat after 1968? And uh, let's say, uh, a result of his discussions with Patochka on like more subjective level, or do you also think that it is parallel to what's going on with in more official philosophy and ideology, uh, which also in a way turns to like everyday life, uh, inquiring about everyday life, leisure and, and subjects like that. Maybe I'll just quickly add to that because it's it's often observed that in Western philosophy, especially French philosophy, you also have a turn to small everyday practice fragmentation away from grand historical and like revolutionary collective action after 1968. So um, it's uh, yeah, I think you, you can ask you know wh whether Kosik is a phenomenon of that same thing or if it, is it something different. Well, uh, you know the the interest in uh, in the everydayness uh, is uh, somehow you know constant by by Kossi because if you if you go back to his texts uh, in the 1950s, for example, he's somehow fascinated with uh, with everydayness, yeah? and he thinks this is something that Marxism is obliged to explain uh, to inquire into. Yeah, so uh, this is as uh, Georgi already mentioned, yeah, the sphere of appearances that uh, is the only, you know, uh, only thing that is given to us and uh, we cannot make uh, some, you know, jump into the essences. We have to go through this phenomenal uh, site yeah, 
of reality and uh, in the sense he's fascinated with everydayness and of course he has uh, much you know um um you know uh how to say it um uh you know not straightforward conception of everydayness as something that is you know sphere of alienation yeah because uh, when he criticizes, for example, uh, Heidegger and his conception of everydayness and, and everyday practices of care, procuring, and so on. So it seems that he thinks that this is, you know, pseudo concrete. Yeah, this is some illusion. We should get rid of it. Yeah. But uh, later on in this book, he also says, you know, we should distinguish between authentic everydayness and alienated everydayness. And he thinks the everydayness is a medium in which we simply uh, live our lives and we cannot uh, do otherwise. Yeah? So in this sense, uh, he only thinks that everydayness uh, can be uh, inflicted uh, by, uh, by you know, certain alienated mechanisms. Yeah? And uh, we should, and this is the, the for him, the 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 topic of marxist critique uh we should uncover these uh alienation alienating uh, mechanisms and try to get rid of them yeah uh late kosik uh i think he has again a much like broader uh perspective because he's thinking you know about the role of technology you know in our thinking, in uh, in our you know informal ontologies, uh, and uh, this of course can you know uh, I mean the, the the ontological framework we we just have in in uh, our heads uh, can influence uh, the way how we cope with with things. Yeah, so uh, this is again. Late Heideggerian motive of uh, of uh, treating you know not only things but also you know living creatures, animals, and even nature as something we can just you know uh, cope with, we can use, and etc. Yeah. So he certainly again would distinguish two types of everydayness: uh, the the everydayness in which we treat things differently, which of course requires that we reconstruct our ontological framework, that we view reality as not something that is at hand for us, uh, that we are not superior in the sense. And uh, that would be something that uh, I think uh, Georgi was uh, hinting on uh, in his uh, talk about you know, certain ecological motives uh, within the Marxism. And uh, Jan, you uh, had a comment also. I just very briefly, I totally agree with Ivan in, in, in this question, but uh, Monica was also right, right? Uh, I mean, this like turn to everydayness and to small things, maybe it's, it's a better, better expression, uh, was definitely caused by the political failure of the Prat Spring, right? And of the, of the project of democratic socialism in which Kosik was heavily influenced. So that's, I, I mean, I mean, uh, I mean, both is, 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 is I mean, it's, it's not monocultural. And Ralph Electoral asks whether this, the, the concept of the pseudo concrete criticizes simple factuality of the everyday in the dialectics of the concrete, uh, Kosi, which, um, would you agree with that formulation, Ivan? Well, uh... I wouldn't say it like that, yeah. Uh, sort of concreteness and uh, in the sense of factuality, uh, I think that for, for Kosik, uh, you know, factuality is also something that, uh, uh, you know, is not avoidable. I mean, uh, we are confronted with certain facts, yeah, and of course, uh, we cannot reject, you know, factuality uh, as uh, something sort of concrete. I would rather, rather say that 
uh, for Kosik, you know, as he differentiates between appearance and the essence. Yeah, he thinks just that uh, we we don't have like direct access to the way how reality is. Yeah, and only what we can do is just uh, proceed, in some sense, phenomenologically uh, through the appearances and uh, destruction of the pseudo concrete means that we somehow, you know. Uh, uh, reject the idea that appearances is all that amounts to reality. It's, you know, that we keep this distinction between how uh, things appear and how they really, really are. Yeah. So he gives, um, uh, I mean, Kosik a few examples of, of uh, this distinction when he talks about, you know, money. Yeah? We usually, uh, use the money day and night yeah uh, we have bank accounts we go to for shopping and so on but uh, we although we can cope with money we don't have a proper understanding of, uh, of what money are uh, if uh, what is inflation and and so on yeah so uh, of course uh, uh, Kosik would say sort of concreteness of the use of money uh, would be would mean that uh, there is only you know this apparent side of the use of money that we can buy something with this piece of paper and so on yeah but uh, there is some essence something behind that that uh, makes money some or this piece of paper something valuable yeah something that has value and something we can uh, with what we can go to the shop and acquire some some goods yeah so uh, i would say soda concrete is the view of appearances as something sufficient something that does not uh has anything that is beyond appearance i don't know if i'm clear but uh that's roughly what uh, uh Kosik thinks about soda concrete yeah, that, that's very helpful, I think, for, I, I think I speak for all the listeners, that that's helpful. Um, and, uh, well, I, I'd like to end it on, a, on an up note. Um, there was a question earlier, also by Ralph Intellectual, uh, about um, Kosik's interest in humor. He wrote on Schweik and on, on Kafka as also a humorist of a sense, um, and wrote about laughter. Um, is laughter also a way, uh, one of these ways of coping with uh, with the defeat after 1968, but but not a purely pessimistic way of coping, we might say. Um, if, if any of the three of you or four of you want to say anything about Kosik's understanding of humor and laughter. Or we can leave it as sort of a, a joke that misses its punchline at the end. Well, if if you don't want to add anything on Kosik and and laughter, then I'll I'll refer readers to the book where uh, several of the authors bring this up. Um, I think. Uh, if I recall, even uh, Ian Ag Angus, as well as Francesco Taba and their pieces especially deal with laughter as an important aspect of, of Kosik's thought. So um, there is, uh, it's very illuminating the, that way it's developed. And, uh, and as I said earlier, the paperback Haymarket edition of the book will be out soon and, and also in not so soon, but eventually we would like to publish more, republish Kosik's uh, earlier work, uh, earlier translations into English, but as well as some never before published translations. So uh, this won't be the last that potential readers hear about Kosik from us. But um, if there are any final words from the participants, this would be the moment to speak up. Monica? I would just like to express my gratitude because I forgot the year there. 
So yeah, thank you very much for the discussion and and for the possibility to be to be here and discuss the book. Yeah, thank thank you for participating and Georgi and Ivan and Jan. Um, I know I I think I understand our own book better now after this discussion as well. So I'm um, I.